name's Kevin Farley. I'm a principal program manager in the SQL Server team at Microsoft. I've been with Microsoft in the SQL Server team for about 15 years. And before that, I've worked in databases and storage software uh, pretty much my whole career. So today we're going to talk about how to keep SQL databases, SQL Server, on Azure VMs highly available. And some of that is same with the rest of SQL Server, any other deployment of SQL Server, because obviously it's the same bits. So we're going to start out by talking about setting some context. So what are we protecting against? So you have disaster recovery and high availability, HADR. We want to make sure that we understand the distinction between those two and what we're protecting against for each one, because they're different and they have different solutions. Disaster recovery. When you have a disaster, you assume the primary site, at least, is not access accessible for an extended period. So that's the disaster is you are completely offline. Communications with the site may not be possible. You have to rely on resources at a remote location. And usually getting back online is the highest priority. Um, anything else pales in comparison to getting your business back online and making revenue again. High availability, on the other hand, they're closely related, but high availability means avoiding any interruption in your business. So protecting against anything that pre prevents an application from accessing the data that it needs. Assume the site and facilities are not impacted, so you have access to the same facility. You don't have to jump between facilities for this. Uh, typically implemented with locally redundant equipment, clusters, availability groups, etc. Outages are typically measured in seconds or minutes. And your metrics are RPO, recovery point objective. And that means after this interruption, how close can we get back to the point we were at right when things went south, when things went bad? And RTO, recovery time objective, how long does it get take to get back online after things shut down? You shouldn't result in any data loss, i.e. we're shooting for an RPO of zero. So that's what a good high availability, a good high availability solution is going to give you an RPO of zero and an RTO of extremely low. So that's what we're protecting against and what we're aiming for here. Also in the idea of getting, going through context, we're going to talk about some of the HADR features in SQL and how they fit into all this. So starting with the DR, we have Backup and Restore. It's been in the product since um, since the very beginning, since SQL 4.2 had dump and load. Um, so Backup Restore means taking a backup, having a backup job that runs periodically and making a copy of your data serialized out to a file that may be on a backup share locally, or it may be in blob, blob storage in a cloud if you're running on an Azure, Azure VM. Uh, so backup and store shouldn't be a mystery to anybody here. It's for disaster recovery only. You're copying your data out to flat files. You can have storage level snapshots in some cases. So if your storage supports it, you can have a snapshot which is virtually instantaneous and takes a, an image of each volume. Um, there are systems which will allow you to do a synchronized snapshot of a number of volumes. So you have a database that's spread across a number of different volumes. They, you get a consistent picture of that. Backups should always be archived off-premise off because if you are protecting yourself from a complete disaster, you need to be able to get to those even if your primary site is down. Uh, that can be a different site owned by you, the customer, or it could be Azure or another cloud provider storage. So having the cloud provider be your offsite storage. Backups should be scheduled. So you want to have them happening regularly like clockwork. So you don't have to think about it. It just happens. And they should be tested regularly. Don't ever just assume that because the job ran, you've got valid backups and are ready to go. Test them. Make sure that they're there. Make sure they're valid, valid and that you can know how to reassemble the database from all those backups. Log shipping is a next step along the evolution. 
So log shipping is how you keep two, site, two or more sites in running in parallel, very close to the same point in time. And what it is, is from your primary server, you have a job that backs up the database periodically. You, so you do full backups and then you do transaction log backups. And the transaction log backup backs up that portion of the transaction log that records all the transactions since the last backup job happened. So you have a series of transaction log backups in your share. You have other jobs running on each of your nodes which copy those backups, the transaction log backups, to the local secondary nodes and applies them. So say every 15 minutes, the primary server does a transaction log backup. That transaction log backup gets copied to each of your secondary nodes and each secondary node applies that. And now your each secondary node is up to date of where the primary was when that backup was taken, which by now is a minute or two in the past. But it's a way to keep multiple um, secondaries online very close so you have a small RPO. You have the, your recovery point is going to be lagging by the time between the disaster and the last backup job on the primary. Uh, again, this has been around for a long time. Secondaries can be put in standby state to give read access. So in between those jobs which replay the transaction log on the secondary, you can put it in a standby state which gives you read access so you can offload reporting that way. It's a very loosely coupled system. It's just those, those jobs are what hangs it all together. Database mirroring um, is another evolution along that, that spectrum where you have the same transaction log data being transferred from your primary to your secondary, but now SQL is taking care of that data movement and it's happening directly. There's no chunking it up into backup files. So there's a new transaction, new trans transactional data transport uh, going between the primary and the secondary. It goes straight from SQL Server to SQL Server. There's no separate jobs. It's all controlled by the engine. The pairing is per database. So it's not the instance, but it's the database. Um, in full safety mode with a witness, you can do automatic failovers. And the witness just says, OK, your primary went down. That guy is now the primary, should now be, be the primary. So you have, it's a quorum situation. So the witness gives you a third vote to make sure that both of your replicas don't decide at the same time that they're both primaries, which would cause problems. Automatic page repair is an interesting facet that came along in database mirroring. It's also available in availability groups when we get there. But there the idea is if the primary is accessing a, a certain data page and the checksums don't match, it comes up as being corrupted, instead of just saying, I can't access your data, sorry, uh, what we do is the primary will then access secondaries and saying, I need this page and give the page identifier. The secondary will read that page in and as long as it's not corrupted as well, we'll send that page over that same transport to the primary. The primary can then repair that page on its own storage and simultaneously respond to the request for data. So it's a pretty cool feature. It's just seamless behind the scenes. You don't know what happened unless you happen to read the logs. Mirroring connection strings are something that we added, and that's where the connection string has two uh, servers. You have the server and the failover server. And what that does is when you make a connection, it automatically routes to the first node in the list. And that's your normal primary. If that node doesn't respond for any reason within a timeout period, then the SQL client will automatically try the failover partner, which is your secondary. And hopefully by that time, the secondary will be responding as the new primary. So that's how you do it. It's a, There's a little bit of lag there when the connection has to tr try the primary and then fail over the secondary. 
always on availability groups. You have availability groups as the next step in that, that continuum, that progression. They live within the confines of a cluster of some sort, either Windows failover cluster, if you're running on Windows, or one of the Linux cluster managers um, out there. So you have your availability group. All the nodes in the availability group have to live within the same cluster so that it can manage quorum and a lot of other transitions that have to take place. So then your availability group uh, lays across that and has replicas on each of the nodes within your availability group. Availability groups, instead of being a, a database pairwise um, matching, availability group is a set of databases that you want to move as a unit. So if you fail over the availability group, all the databases in that group move from node to node. So if they're primary on node one, and you do a failover to node three, all those da three databases will be primary on node three. And the idea there is that there's a lot of cases where an application may need to access more than one database in order to, to do its business. This way, all the databases that application needs to uh, interact with are available on the new primary node. Um, so that's how that works. You have each node has its own SQL Server instance, and then your availability group goes across those instances. And you can have more than one availability group with disjoint sets of databases. Availability groups also have a little bit tighter method of directing connections to the current primary. They have a, there's a floating IP address of some sort, depending on the platform, which is assigned to the current primary. So you have what's called a listener. And that listener is separate from the node's primary IP address. And it again, it moves with the primary role. So whichever role is primary also is assigned the IP address for the listener. So when connections come in, if they're, they're addressed to the listener, they'll automatically go directly to the node, which is the current primary. So that gives you a much faster and more automatic way. You don't, all the clients don't need to know how many replicas are in your group. So as you would if you had a database mirroring style connection string, it just automatically happens. Distributed availability groups are a different kind of availability groups. They're availability groups whose members are themselves availability groups. So it's a loosely coupled group. Um, so obviously, they, if they contain an, availab an availability group, then all the databases within that availability group are members of this distributed AG. So they need to have the same databases in them. There's no cluster common cluster infrastructure. And that's one of the key facets that makes availability, distributed availability groups useful. Um, they're good for high latency multi-site configurations. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I can probably best describe that by giving you an example from real world example. They're, so we had a customer who had a major forum, online forum system. So people would type in their their quote their posts and people from all over the place would read it. And it was very popular. They had their HA system for this whole forum system was to have one availability group that spanned the North American continent. So they had replicas literally on, from coast to coast. And that was great because even if there was a complete outage at one of the sites, they had multiple other sites that could fail over and still have that. The one challenge that they had with that was that that required one Windows failover cluster to span that complete wide area network. And there's a lot of latency there. So that can cause problems with failure detection. You can get false failure detections if you have too much latency in, in the site. And also when you're 
going over network links that long, occasionally there's network outages, network hiccups. And one of those hiccups, even though both sides are still alive, will be seen as a failure. And the way that they had things set up, they always wanted their primary site to be the primary site. They just wanted the other sites available for read access. They didn't want it to fail over. So they set up the quorum vote such that that site was the only one that could have quorum. When they lost network connectivity though, then the remote sites would see that as a loss of quorum and go off offline, which you wouldn't think would be too big of a problem, except that they had other ancillary applications that ran on their, their secondary sites. And when those secondary sites took themselves offline for loss of quorum, that was a big interruption in their business. So in order to deal with that, we had, we designed availability, distributed availability groups. So distributed availability groups, again, are an availability group whose members are other AG. So in this case, the primary site would be its own AG and each of the secondary sites would have its own AG. And the primary site would see one or more of the secondary sites as members of its availability group. So it would, same time that it's replicating updates to the primaries, to the secondaries locally, it would also send those updates to each of the remote sites. And then that site had one node that would be in the role that ordinarily would be called primary, but since you can't do updates to a distributed AG primary, we call it the forwarder because it accepts changes only from the primary and then forwards them out to the other nodes within that remote availability group. So there you have decoupled the distributed availability group and the secondaries from the quorum requirements at the primary site. So having network drop is going to mean that they fall behind, but there's no loss of quorum, so this, the remote sites remain up, and people can still read, read to from their closest replica. Um, so, and you can daisy chain these AGs with distributed AGs. So you have one AG from site one to site two and another AG from site two to site three and just daisy chain those updates. The other nice aspect of that when you're going over wide area links is instead of sending updates directly to each of the replicas in the remote site, you now send one update to the remote site to the forwarder and it takes care of fanning, fanning that out to the other replicas on that site. So DR site without distributed AGs looks like this. Uh, with a distributed AG, each site has its own AG. Updates go from the primary of AG1 out to the, for to the local secondary and out to the forwarder on AG2. And that forwarder then takes care of replicating out to its remote sites. One of the other um, additions that came into availability groups um, is direct seeding. So norm previously, the way that you would get a, a database seeded into the secondary, so you have a primary that has the database, you want the secondary to have that database be a part of the availability group, you have to get the database out there in the first place somehow. So you would typically do a backup to some file share that the secondary had access to and do a restore with no recovery on the secondary and then let the availability group start catching it up. It's a workable solution, but it's not ideal. So what we have invented is the idea that since we have a mechanism for taking backup light data and moving it over a transport, we can do the same thing with the backup of the database initially. So what we do is we do a full backup of the database on the primary and instead of writing it to a file, we send it over the transport to the secondary. Secondary does a restore without recovery, and then it just resumes catching up with the log transport. So it makes it very easy to add, add databases or add replicas without having to deal with the backup and restore pipeline. Another whole class of 
solution is called failover clustering. It's also been around for a long time. Um, and that's usually an OS entity, the failover clustering, whether that's Linux or Windows. Uh, there's various flavors of it. So you have a failover cluster instance of SQL, which has primary and secondary. So this is not, this diagram shows the left side is one point in time, the right side is a second point in time after the failover. So you have your failover cluster instance that is running on the first node, and it has access to some storage which is physically shared, so it can be accessed by either node directly. So the first node has ownership of that disk, and the second node can't access it. So one node at a time has accesses, and the cluster arbitrates that. So after failover, um, the failover cluster, the SQL instance on the primary, uh, the original node is shut down, and it's brought up on the secondary at the same time that the storage is moved over to that node. Storage is mounted, SQL comes up and starts, and to SQL it looks like it's just the same, it's running against the same data, all the same databases, same master, all that is the same, physically the same. It just is running on new hardware now. So failover cluster instances have been around for a long time. Now there's a number of different ways you can accomplish that shared storage, which is the key part of failover clustering. You can have file shares, so just traditional SMB file shares. In Azure VMs, you can use premium file shares, which is a, a popular way of doing that, setting up that neutral storage that it can be connected to by either, either node. Storage Spaces Direct is a Windows cluster technology which does replication. So you have local storage on each node, and Storage Spaces Direct is a Windows storage level system which replicates changes from one node to the other and also works directly with the clustering system to arbitrate access. So then you have the sh storage is shared. You have du double the storage, but it's local, so you have better uh, performance that way. And one of the new things that I'll be talking a little bit more about in a bit are Azure Shared Disk. So Azure Shared Disks are disks within the Azure VM infrastructure, which can be connected to more than one VM within Azure. And again, they coordinate with the Windows failover clustering and give you access. Just It looks just like a physically shared disk would look. And it can attach to one or the other. It uh, obeys the same SCSI reservations which clustering uses to get exclusive access to the disk. Now we're going to switch to talking strictly about disaster recovery and high availability in Azure VMs. So I've been talking in broad strokes about how to do HADR with SQL Server, and now I'm going to be more specific about Azure VMs. So there's a number of different HADR technologies within Azure VMs as it relates to SQL Server. You have always-on availability groups. Uh, we've discussed what those are, how they work. They're possible to do within Azure VMs. Failover cluster instances can be done um, with shared storage. Uh, we've mentioned a number of technologies for sharing the storage between nodes within a failover cluster. Log shipping can work as well. You can set up file shares that can be accessed by multiple nodes and have all the same log shipping jobs running. SQL Server Backup Restore with Azure Blob Storage service um, is another way to do backup and restore that leverages the Azure storage account and the blob storage. So you can do backups directly to a blob within Azure. That gives you uh, a neutral third place to store your backups that can be accessed by multiple VMs wherever they may um, exist. And database mirroring works within Azure, although it has been deprecated since SQL Server 2016. Um, 
it is it's not being removed anytime soon but it's also not progressing it's not being invested in so that's a pattern that you'll see a lot is features get deprecated um, because we want people to continue moving forward we're not as frequently removing features from the product because that would break some of our customers but we're also not investing in them so we'll keep them in kind of suspended animation if you will So some concepts to know when you're thinking about availability within Azure, uh, Azure VMs within the data centers. So there are some concepts, um, availability set with premium storage. Um, availability set has disks spanning. Each disk is striped across multiple machines within the same rack. So the green objects are racks within the data center. Um, so an availability set will be within, all within the same data center. Each VM will have a disk which is mounted, which is striped across nodes in, in a rack. Um, with Azure native files, with ANF, um, you can have both VMs sharing one storage on the same rack. Um, so that's another option there. Zonal VMs with ultra storage, you have each VM which is guaranteed to live in a separate availability zone. So availability zone has multiple data centers. So you have zone one, zone two, zone three here. Um, so if you really want disaster recovery tolerance, fault tolerance, you'll make sure that you have each VM in your environment being hosted in a different zone. That way there's never a chance that one data center goes down and takes takes down all of your VMs at the same time. Um, the, another parameter that you have is proximity placement groups. And that's not an availability feature, it's a performance feature. What that does is if you put a number of resources, storage and VMs in a proximity place, placement group, it guarantees that they all will be within the same data center and generally network close. They may not be in the same rack, but they're gonna be close from a network latency standpoint. And so this is how you avoid the issues of within a region, we have multiple data centers, obviously, and they may or may not be within the same city. Um, that's how we get disaster resilience within a region. If you have your VM in one city and your storage in a different city, then applications get sluggish because there's latency between the two of them and, and your IO is running slower there. So the solution to that is proximity placement groups, which get you um, the same, same data center and so tight latency uh, specs for that. The, what you give up with that is loss of the zonal availability. So you don't have multiple copies within different availability zones. So when you see availability sets and availability zones, um, that's what we're talking about. So high availability for SQL Server on Azure VMs. There's two ways to approach this. You can optimize for performance and that yields you about 99.95% availability or you can optimize for resiliency and get up to 99.99 percent availability and both of these are ha um, strategies they're just there's trade-offs that you make in depending on how you lay things out and the trade-offs can be weighted either towards performance or towards resiliency so if you want to get that last 0.04 percent then you're going to go through the optimize for resiliency path. So if you're optimizing for performance, you're gonna make sure that all the VMs are in the same availability set. So the same set of data centers. Um, so you're not going to be crossing large geographic distances. Uh, that leaves you open to the case where an entire site goes down, which is an exceedingly rare situation. I know of one case where that has happened that I'm aware of in Azure and had to do with lightning striking the, the facility. Uh, 
and taking out communications. So not a, not a really common thing to happen. But that is the vulnerability on, on the plus side. They're close from a networking standpoint, so you get higher I.O. performance and lower latencies. Uh, synchronous AGs, availability groups, uh, you have synchronous replication, SQL Server failover cluster instances with storage spaces direct, which is replication, replicating between the copies, or pre premium file shares, or now you have the option of Azure shared disks, which would have to be within the same data center and ideally within the same rack. So those are the technologies you would use uh, to optimize for performance. Optimizing for resiliency, you're going to be spread over multiple availability zones, what we call zonal avail availability. And that makes sure that no two of the main objects live within the same availability zone. That way, if a zone gets taken out, you still have replicas online and available to you. Always on availability groups with synchronous replication is, is an option out there as well. Um, the one concern is that with the potentially greater distances, you may have more latency within the availability group re replication. And if it's running synchronous, that means the primary is going to wait for the round trip with the latency involved. And so it may slow down operations on your primary. SQL Server failover cluster instance with premium file share is a valid solution for uh, HA when you're optimizing for resiliency. Azure Shared Disks can't span sites, so you can't do those with this strategy. Always on availability groups configuration with SQL IaaS extension. So there's now an IaaS extension. Um, you may see it referred to as resource provider. That's a name that turned out not to be very intuitive, so we're phasing it out. And that's um, within Azure, it's an entity that knows about the scope of the availability. So when you have an, a VM that is has the IaaS, the SQL IaaS extension installed, then it, it knows about availability concepts. So you can go down with this extension in the portal. You can say, let me look at the high availability high availability status of this VM and say, well, I want to make this part of an availability group and have that all orchestrated within the portal, if you wish. Or you can do it through other scripting. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But the idea is that Azure helps you to do all that orchestration in creating the availability groups um, and other topologies. So you can automate with uh, always on an availability group within the Azure CLI. So it's a, a command line interface to create the entities within that. You can automate always on AG with Azure Quick Start templates. So templates are a way to get a template. You edit in the specifics. So these are the names of my VMs. These are the, this is the, a subscription I want to use. This is the resource groups, all those sorts of things, give names to the different entities, and then just submit it. And it runs as a job within Azure and out pops your availability group. Or you can use the Azure portal. This is in preview yet, but it's really slick. You can just, like I say, click on the high availability blade within your VM and Tell it, I want an availability group. I want these to be my replicas. And yeah, hook it up to a load balancer or not. Um, and set it loose. And it does all that grunt work for you. All the orchestration that takes time. Uh, it's availability. SQL Server failover instances with premium file shares. It gives you ease of management. File shares are fully managed by Azure. You can lower the work on your virtual machines. So input or output is offloaded to your virtual to your managed file share. 
um, input and output, you can have burstable capacity, which means that if you normally have them configured for a certain level of performance, it will allow you to burst above that cap briefly and then come back down. And you can also configure them for zonal redundancy, which we've discussed uh, just a bit ago. There's a step-by-step -step tutorial to configure a SQL Server failover cluster instances with, fail with premium file shares. Um, that's linked to in the deck. Uh, the pros, it's fully managed file storage up to 100 terabytes. Uh, burstable performance, use Active Directory accounts and private links. Cons, it, you can't, SQL cannot do caching. So you're not, well, SQL can do caching, but the VM is not going to do caching on it. And you generally get lower IOPS to size ratio. So a lot of the disks in Azure for a given size gives you a number of IOPS. And the theory being the, the more data that you're storage, the more IOPS you're going to require to access it. So with premium file shares, that ratio of IOPS to terabyte is lower than it is with other disks. So those are the trade-offs there. Uh, and again, it's a very valid way to set up HA. It's very straightforward, very simple. Another way to do a failover cluster storage is with Storage Spaces Direct, S2D is their shortcut for it. And this is a Windows failover cluster uh, technology. Again, it uses internal replication to present the uh, image within the VM of a single set of storage. And that same image will be on your secondary VM. The storage is actually local and the storage space is direct within the cluster is responsible for keeping the two in sync uh, content wise. So it presents the image of as if it were the same disk. So you have your, have your Azure VM with data disks that are local. So you have nice snappy local performance for your data. And Storage Spaces Direct is managing keeping those two in sync. So when you, you fail over, rather than having from instance one to instance two, rather than disconnecting the storage from one and connecting it to the other, when the second node comes up online, it sees the disk as if it had been moved and mounted, but what you're actually looking at is a local copy of exactly the same disks. Disk size have different uh, capacities and um, characteristics. So the P4 is going to top out at 32 gigabytes, give you 120 IOPS per disk, and your throughput is going to be 25 megabytes per second. Going up to the mid-range on P15 is going to have 256 gigabytes of size, up to 1,100 IOPS, and 125 megabytes per second. P40 is 2 terabytes in size, 7,500 IOPS per disk, and 250 megabytes per second. All the way up to P70, which is 16 terabytes, 18,000 IOPS per disk, and 750 megabytes per second. So that's the scale within Azure Disks. And then we're layering on top of that Storage Spaces Direct technology to make that highly available within the cluster. So the pros, you, have, you can scale to VM max for IOPS and throughput. So each VM size also has caps on IOPS and throughput. You can lever, leverage Azure Blob Cache for premium disks, so you get that caching. So that speeds up your I.O. as well. Um, one of the cons is that Storage Spaces Direct is only available in, SQL, in Windows Server 2016 and above, and it requires um, maintenance as well. Backup in Azure VMs. So backup options for SQL Server and Azure VMs. Um, you have automated backups, which will give you point in time. So this is backups in the Azure VM. Uh, will give you point in time restore, up to 15 minute recovery point. So 
you can get as close as fifth the most data that you would lose is 15 minutes um, you don't have long-term retention or built-in support for always on you can do you can restore data, databases with store SQL Server Management Studio or transact SQL scripts Azure backup for SQL Server is specifically organized for SQL Server it's Azure backup with additional um, capabilities to specifically understand SQL Server. So you can manage multiple servers in one dashboard, point in time restore, 15 minute RPO, long term backup retention, months, years, whatever, built in support for SQL Server always on, uh, consolidated email reports if there's failures. Um, you restore not through uh, SQL Management Studio or transact SQL scripts, but you do through the Azure Backup UI. So that's that's where you manage those backups and restores. Or you can do manual backup within SQL Server to Azure Blobs. And again, you get point in time restore, uh, up to 15, point, 15 minute recovery point. And you also can restore databases from Management Studio or other T-SQL scripts. So aka.ms slash SQL backup options is uh, another way to look at that. Automated backups available for SQL Server 2014 plus. Um, SQL Server 2014 gives you automated backup with SQL Server 2014 virtual machines. Uh, SQL Server 2016 has automated backup v2 for Azure virtual machines. So again, it's a, an Azure entity that gives you automated backup that knows about SQL Server. Service provided by the SQL Server VM IS extension resource provider, you must be running in the full mode. So the full mode is when you have an agent attached and actually monitoring your system. That's an optional thing. You don't have to do that. You can just have the portal helping to manage you. Um, you can run it in full mode, which means that you have management happening within your VM. Leverages managed backup to URL. So you can back up to Azure storage account that you configure. So set up your storage account with whatever characteristics, locations, etc. It supports encryption you can retain backups up to 30 days. So these are the automated backup um, facilities that we have. Azure Backup for SQL Server VM. You can use it for migration. So SQL Server 2008, you have GA support for SQL, 7000, SQL Server 2008, and Azure SQL Server 2008 R2 um, as a source. You can use it to modernize, uh, have support for SQL Server 2019 support with GA, uh, Windows Server 2019, so I'll get that far to the current versions of both of those. You can restore anywhere, where you can restore as backup files. You can extract your backup BAK files out of the Azure Store, or you can restore it as a database. Zero infrastructure, so it's all handled by Azure. Long-term retention, so you can schedule it to be kept as long as you want, or maybe your quarterly backups get kept for 10 years, and your daily backups get, ten, get kept for one year. However you want to schedule that retention policy, you can do. 15-minute RPO, so up to 15 minutes is the most data that you might lose in this scenario. Auto protection, so this the data stored within the Azure storage blobs is automatically redundant, protected, guaranteed to be there. Point in time restore, within that time period, you can restore at any point in time, just like any other Azure uh, and SQL backup restores. And there's central monitoring, so you can have it monitored on, on a dashboard and know exactly where you're going to be at. Distributed network names is a new technology. We just released support for that in SQL Server 2019 
CU8, I believe. Um, what this is is an alternative way. It's a infrastructure within Windows failover cluster distribu distributed network name, and it's an alternative to the virtual network name that we've used all along with within Azure. And this is valid for both failover cluster instances as well as um, availability groups. What it does is instead of having the floating IP address that moves from node to node, you have a way of constructing a name which is bound to more than one IP address. And it then doesn't need the load balancer. So the big advantage of this is that you remove the load balancer from the configuration. And that way, um, you have a lot less complexity in setting things up if you don't have to deal with the load balancer. And it's also a little bit faster to do failure detection because you're not waiting for the load balancer to do its periodic health checks to know when it's time to move the connection. Um, you have SQL's facilities to directly know that. DNN's currently supported for failover clusters of SQL Server 2019, CU8, and later on Windows 2016. And again, this is also supported in availability groups as of CU8. A bit about Azure Shared Disk. And again, this is a way to have physically shared storage within Azure. So you have Azure Disks. So you let Azure take care of all the configuration of the disk. Make sure, let Azure deal with the guarantees there. Uh, enables fast failover and high availability for cluster databases, parallel file systems, and container volumes. We're interested in the cluster databases, obviously. So you have multiple disks on multiple VMs, uh, supports SCSI 3 persistent reservations, which is how Windows failover cluster arbitrates access to a shared disk. Um, the node that's currently the primary takes out a persistent reservation on that disk, and nobody else can get right access to it. So Windows-based Windows scenarios, SQL Server FCI, scale-out file server, uh, remote desktop server, remote profile, disk RDS, um, again, SQL Server as part of the FCI. And um, so that makes a much faster solution for that. Um, you're not going through SMB protocols to get to a file share. Um, you're not having to duplicate the volume of storage to have a solution like Storage Spaces Direct, where you have the same data replicated on multiple nodes. You have one copy of that data, um, and it's directly attached to your node when you're the prim primary node. Again, you don't have secondaries that are available to do read access because only the primary has any access to those storage within a failover cluster instance. Linux also has distributions for Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE, Oracle, um, OCFS2, GFS2, Kubernetes, Roblox volumes um, also support these Azure shared disks. And GA support for proximity placement group and non-proximity placement groups. Fault to my more than one fault domain for availability set and VMs, uh, broader regional coverage is coming at, at GA. Scenario here, you have a cluster jet application, in this case, SQL Server. So the first node takes up, red, they both register with the disk. Uh, first node does a reserve with exclusive uh, reservation, the second, the reservation is enforced there. The second node on failover will preempt the write, and then the reservation gets updated to the new node. So that's how kind of the low level, storage level protocols work for doing a failover. So the second node gets access to that disk. You can also have accesses that understand multiple access to the same physical disk that's not SQL Server. Um, 
but again this is a way that you can structure that so that the initiator has read and write access the other nodes have read access only from the from that volume SQL failover cluster instances on failover Windows failover cluster um, it's a direct lift and shift from what you're used to with an on-premise failover cluster that has shared physically shared storage it's built for Windows Server and SQL Server 2008 and above it's literally looks to SQL just like a physically shared disk whether that's um, a SCSI box with two cables coming out of it or a SAN or whatever solution that you may have um, that's how this works premium SSD uh, for storage p15 to p80 so 256 gigabytes up to 32 terabytes ultra disks 4 gigabytes up to 64 terabytes ultra disks are extremely fast um, low latency disks um, Azure blob cache is not available but again you've got extremely fast storage on a, on the with the base just the base disks supports disk striping via Windows Server shared storage spaces and 2019 support is pending it supports disk cloud file share witness for the cluster that's a SQL feature you can isolate your data and log disk to optimize performance so you can have obviously more than one shared disk storage within your cluster leverage ultra disk as the log disk for low latency writes because that's what SQL is most performance sensitive on the update path is to the log writes um, so again this is a way to have shared disk storage um, right now the support within Azure premium file premium disks or ultra disks is limited to select regions it is GA but limited to select regions for ultra disk premium disks it's available in all data centers ultra disks more regions are coming online quickly so just keep monitoring the availability for that some PowerShell script examples um, so you set up a disk config so it's a new Azure disk config location is East US so that's your region creation option empty so you're not pulling a template from someplace for the content on the disk it's an empty disk disk size in gigabytes is 1024 so that's a terabyte size disk SKU name that's premium locally redundant storage premium LRS so that's premium disk versus ultra you would have ultra storage uh, max shares equals two is the new parameter that tells us that we want to share this and we're going to have up to two VMs connecting to this disk so you take that that's your configuration that you've created for how you want the disk to be laid out when it gets created now you create it so data disk is new Azure disk resource group name is Contoso demo disk name is shared data disk and the disk is your disk configuration so that's what actually instantiates that shared disk then on your VM to attach the disk in PowerShell you say get Azure VM with your name resource group um, add Azure VM data disk with your VM create option attached manage disk ID your data disk ID LUN 0 you're going to make that LUN 0 on this machine update Azure VM with your disk configuration and that makes it so so that that's how you attach that disk to one VM and then you'd replicate those steps the attachment steps on subsequent VMs to attach to the same disk SCSI reservation supported commands so again this looks to the operating system and to uh, SQL just like a physically shared disk so the SCSI which is a protocol low-level storage protocol um, will give you write exclusive persistent reservation and all those options are there Some considerations for shared disk it's available on premium SSD and ultra disk uh, 
could only be used as data disk, not as operating system disk. Obviously, you can't have the operating system as a shared disk. On premium SSD, the disk sizes are P15 and above, 256 gigabytes and above. The max mounts limit is scaled with the disk size. So the larger the disk, the more VMs you can attach to it. On ultra disk, there's no size restrictions. Any ultra disk can be used for a shared disk. And the max mount limit is five for all ultra disks. Some more information for all of this stuff. Um, so further reading, Azure shared disk, Azure disk storage, aka.ms slash Azure disk. We'd like to hear from you on the Azure backup, um, shared disk for ASR migration. Uh, so anything having to do with the Azure storage, these are contacts for reach out to the team, uh, give us feedback, etc. So I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful for you. And thanks for supporting Data Platform Geeks and SQL Server Geeks.